So now let's meet Carlene Cast. Carlene is a nutritionist, a cookbook author, and the founder of Seelicious, a popular omega-3 fish oil brand. Carlene is also passionate about nutrition and healing the body from the inside out. And she's here to teach us about cooking for gut health. So hi, Carlene. How's it going in the kitchen? Hey, Jonathan. Thanks for the intro. Uh, welcome to my kitchen. We are here and uh, I'm fermenting up a storm. You can smell the sauerkraut already. And today I am so excited because I'm actually talking about what I think is probably one of the hottest topics around right now. And that is gut health and how to feed your gut, how to love it, nurture it, and take care of something called the mighty microbiome. So I know you all had the pleasure of just previously listening to Dr. Dr. Gaetano, uh, who also happens to be my husband, <laughs> in case you didn't realize that. Um, so it's kind of fun because he was coming to you from a scientific perspective and as a nutritionist and uh, somebody who loves food and loves to create in the kitchen. I have been so excited about this uh, fermenting experiment that I've been working on. I have done a number of fermented veg in the past and I do everything from pickling and fermenting and uh, recently started to make my own kefir, um, which if you've not done that before, it's a really fun and easy uh, thing to do at home. And I always believe that anytime you can make something yourself at home, it's even better for you. So the gut is such an important topic because we know that that is kind of central to our health. And we have heard that the healthier your gut is, the healthier you are, especially in relation to our immune system, because we know that those bacteria line and uh, our immune system is actually found in the gut. So 70 to 80% of our immune system is in our gut. So it only makes sense that we take uh, really good care of it. And one of the best ways that you can do that is by food. So what you eat every single day uh, does impact how you feel. And I actually think that that's probably one of our greatest gifts and the silver lining in health in that you're in control. You can make changes. And I started out on my health journey over 20 years ago, and it's just kind of continued to grow and evolve based on different stages of my life. And I wasn't fermenting food 20 years ago, but I am now and I love it. And it just kind of continues to, to grow and change. And so if you're just starting on your health journey, know that investing time uh, and energy to learn about how you can repair your own gut is a worthwhile use of um, a worthwhile use of your time. So I want to talk today about um, how we can feed our microbiome. So as you heard, our microbiome is this contains these hundreds of trillions of bacteria. In fact, we're more bacteria than we are cells. And think about your microbiome as being found at kind of housed at all the entry points in. In your body, from the mouth, in your gut, in your nose, um, you name it. Wherever you think your entry points of your body are is where your bacteria and your microbiome are found. And so there's a number of different things that happen in our daily life that will negatively and or positively impact our microbiome. So when we were born, depending on how you were born, whether you were born via a C-section or vaginal birth, that was when your microbiome started to get established. And then as a baby, whether or not you were breastfed or formula fed, um, how many organisms and bacteria you were exposed to. So if you were allowed to kind of play in the garden, in the backyard, the more diverse exposure to bacteria you have, the more diverse your microbiome is. And your microbiome kind of continued to be established until about the age of three, and that's where it sort of leveled off and continued. Now, as we age and we get older, a, a number of different things that we are exposed to in our environment can, let's talk about the negative, can negatively impact and create something known as dysbiosis. So an imbalance of bacteria, everything from having too much stress in your life, and stress has a major impact on the type of bacteria found in your gut, to the kind of food that you're eating. If you're eating a lot of processed food, if you're eating a lot of sugar, that will negatively impact your microbiome and the type of bacteria found there. Um, to whether or not you've taken antibiotics would probably be the most well-known example of a prescription drug that will negatively impact the microbiome uh, to sleeping pills, antacids. So if in your life you have um, come across some of these different factors, which 
none of you have stress, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, it will have impacted the health of your gut and impacted your microbiome. But like I said, it doesn't end there. And there is a number of things that we can do to repair that. So let's talk about food, because as I said, what you eat every day does impact how you feel. And one of the best things that we can do for our gut is to eat a variety of plant-based foods. And I know so many of you think about plant-based and feel a little intimidated, and I understand why, because you think about your day going, oh, I'm gonna be stuck eating raw vegetables and fruit every day, but there's so many different options. And a plant-based diet includes things like, yes, your fruit and veg, of course, but also things like nuts and seeds, chia, hemp, flax. These are easy and versatile additions that you can make to your diet. Starting first thing in the morning, if you're eating a beautiful bowl of oatmeal, you can take a spoonful of hemp seeds and put them on top. If you're making a smoothie, you could use all three of them. So there's a many different ways that you can incorporate these beautiful seeds that contain a lot of fiber. Um, nuts, and, as I mentioned, different legumes that can be incorporated into beautiful curries and soups. So there's so many different ways that we can incorporate these plant-based foods. Now, what is it specifically about these plant foods that are so good for your gut? Well, they contain something about fiber. And I know that's not a new topic for you, but I cannot reinforce how important it is to have a variety of fiber. And fiber is such an interesting nutrient because we're not actually even digesting it. It's one of its main purposes is to feed good bacteria in your gut. So the more fiber you feed your bacteria, the more diverse and the more populated your microbiome will be with these healthy bacteria. So number of plant-based foods you eat each week and the diversity of plant-based foods you eat each week are a couple of really important considerations. So a quick rule of thumb, and I learned this from a colleague who I really admire, she always recommends for people to uh, incorporate about 30 different plant foods each week. So if you're always in the habit of buying basmati rice, maybe the next time you incorporate black rice. If you always use chia seeds, maybe next time you switch over to hemp seeds. If you always eat almonds, next time switch to walnuts. So there's so many different ways that even within the same food type or food group that you can incorporate diversity. Even here, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to show both a purple cabbage and a green cabbage. They're both important for you, they're both gonna provide beneficial bacteria and nutrients to your gut, but they also offer a little bit of a different, a uh, little bit of a different uh, angle for your gut. And so diversity in your food is uh, really important. So fiber is one of the most important nutrients that we can, um, that we can eat, and that's gonna come from your plant-based foods. Uh, the other component and the other category of nutrients that we hear a lot of for gut health are something called probiotics. And I mentioned this briefly, PRO, probiotic. These are good bacteria. There are two main families of probiotics that live inside your gastrointestinal tract. Uh, the lactobacilli family, which is in the small intestinal tract, and the bifidobacteria family in the large intestinal tract. Both are incredibly important for the function and the role of your gastrointestinal tract. And when you think about probiotic foods, these come from things like fermented foods. So I've got an assortment of fermented foods that I've actually been making this week. They've been fermenting for um, about uh, five days now, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about fermenting veg in a minute. But these fermented foods actually contain probiotics, those good bacteria. If you've heard of kombucha before, you're going to get some nice healthy bacteria from the kombucha, um, yogurt, sauerkraut, miso, tempeh, kimchi. These are all foods that contain these beneficial bacteria for your gut. You can also, of course, supplement with probiotics, which many people do, and uh, something that's often recommended, especially for people who have maybe been on certain medications or um, taken an antibiotic, as an example or for general health and wellness, you can incorporate uh, good bacteria in capsule form. I always believe in starting with your food first. So anytime you can eat these foods, maybe pick two per week that you wanna start incorporating into your diet. And this is just gonna help continue to grow um, a diverse bacterial range inside your gut. So when you're looking at incorporating more probiotic foods in the diet, of course I have a food first philosophy. So a couple of times a week, make a conscious effort 
effort maybe on Sundays when you're planning to do your grocery shopping think to yourself what can I eat this week that's going to add more of these beneficial bacteria to my gut and then of course if you want if you're interested you can always incorporate um, probiotics in capsule form that you can take on a daily basis so just as important are these good bacteria those probiotics they need to eat something they are living organisms just like we are we need to eat so do they what do probiotics eat they eat prebiotics and these are certain fiber rich foods that really help those good bacteria to grow and flourish and multiply in our gastrointestinal tract so think things like leeks and onions garlic turmeric ginger artichokes bananas pears you name it these are going to provide a really valuable source of fiber to help feed the good bacteria so prebiotics are just as important if not more more than probiotics. So again, we come back to the value of having a very fiber rich diet and how important that really is for our gut. So remember diversity, fiber, probiotics, prebiotics, this is going to be the beginning of establishing and really rebalancing your microbiome. So the last kind of category of food that I want to talk about, and this is where it gets kind of fun, is something called fermented foods. So fermented foods have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And in fact, if you look at different cultures around the world, kind of each of them have come up with their sort of popular fermentation process whether you're looking at the Japanese and you're looking at uh, Korean like kimchi or the French with sour cream. Uh, there's so many different uh, options of fermented foods that we can incorporate into our diet now or of course you can even make them at home. And uh, this is one of the things that I enjoy doing. So fermentation is, uh, like I said, it's been around for centuries and it's really a neat process because it uses bacteria to actually break down sugars and kind of complex carbohydrates in your food. So you're probably thinking, why would we want to ferment something? I thought that was a negative. No, it's actually incredibly beneficial. And certain foods are more digestible. The nutrients are more bioavailable when they've been fermented. Um, they increase beneficial bacteria and they allow them to flourish in our gut. So that's another reason why we want to ferment certain foods. And they actually can minimize certain toxins or nutrient inhibitors, something like phytic acid. So when we ferment, we are actually taking away some of those toxins and those anti-nutrients, allowing the food to just be better off, better used in our digestive system. So fermentation has been around for a long time. The neat thing is you don't actually have to buy fermented food. You can do it at home yourself. Now, don't confuse fermenting with pickling. That's different. So pickling, we're actually almost doing the opposite where we're adding in an acid. This, we are using bacteria to break down sugar. So it's almost the opposite process of, uh, of pickling. So just keep that in mind because when you look here, you might think, oh, that looks like pickled carrots, pickles, uh, pickled onions, etc. And it's an opposite process called fermentation. So it takes about five to seven days to properly ferment food. And there's a few different principles involved. You need to have salt. So generally speaking, when you're fermenting vegetables, you're gonna also be creating a, a salt water brine that you're gonna use to top over the vegetables. And you wanna make sure that your veg is completely submerged in that brine. Then you're gonna either partially cover or fully cover. And I'll explain why there's two different ways to do that. And then you're gonna allow it to ferment the longer you let it sit, the more fermented it comes. So the combination of the salt, the minimizing the oxygen levels will help those vegetables um, to ferment. And many fermented foods are vegetables, which is interesting. And fermented foods oftentimes contain probiotics. So probiotics are usually fermented foods, but not all fermented food contains probiotics, if that makes sense. If you have also heard about how wine is made or chocolate, um, those do not contain probiotics but they have been formed um, during via a fermentation process, just like sourdough bread. So sourdough bread has a lot of beneficial uh, compounds for your gut and it's a great form of bread to eat, but it's not actually gonna give you probiotics. So I wanted to show you how to make something really easy that you can do at home and it would take you under 15 minutes to prepare this and this is something called sauerkraut. So even having um, a couple of tablespoons of sauerkraut a day, either you eat it on your own or you put it on a burger or however 
however you want to eat it, it is going to provide all these beautiful uh, probiotics for your gut. The fermentation of the cabbage um, just allows those bacteria to flourish. And so I'm going to show you the process. So I've actually uh, started fermenting this particular cabbage earlier in the week. So it's been about five or six days now and it's pretty much ready. I could leave it longer and it will allow it to ferment even more. But I think it's good now so I'm actually going to, after today, I'm going to pop it into the fridge and be able to eat it. So technically all you need to make uh, sauerkraut at home is a cabbage and you can use either purple cabbage or green and really any variety of cabbage that you like. I actually uh, picked this green cabbage this morning from our garden. It was my last one and I was actually saving it on purpose to be able to ferment it uh, today to make the sauerkraut um, or you could definitely use purple cabbage as well. Now the other uh, equipment you need, just so that you know, you need a jar to store it um, and either uh, a lid or cheesecloth that you can put over top with a rubber, rubber band. Uh, some type of, you can use your hands if you want, or this is actually meant to make sauerkraut and fermented vegetables because one of the keys is keeping it submerged. And then salt. So salt has a couple of very valuable, uh, plays a very valuable role when you're making fermented veg or you're making sauerkraut. First of all, with the sauerkraut, when you put the salt over top of the cabbage and you massage it in, I'm gonna show how you do that, it actually helps to release some of the water and some of the juices and that's what's going to allow um, the uh, breakdown of the starch and create those good bacteria, those probiotics. So the salt creates, helps to create create this um, perfect environment and that's one of the things that we need when we are when we are fermenting. So the salt plays a really important role. So sea salt or non-iodized salt is usually um, what I recommend. Also it's going to actually allow the veg to keep some of its crispness which you want. You don't want it to be all soggy and mushy. So um, the salt is going to play a really important role. Now different than vegetables we're not going to be using a water brine. We're going to be actually taking the salt and putting it right onto the cabbage and massaging it with our hand. Now, depending on how salty you like it or how fermented you like it, that will be um, that will determine how much salt you want to use. So, anywhere from about one to three um, one to three teaspoons of salt for about a half a head of cabbage would be ideal. But you can use more. And um, but if you're using less, it's just going to take a little bit longer to ferment. So it's totally up to you. But it's going to need about at least one teaspoon of sea salt for about a half a pound, uh, half a head of cabbage. I've already gone ahead and um, washed this with sterile water. If you don't have filtered water, you can easily do it yourself just by boiling water and letting it cool. You don't want to use chlorinated water because chlorine is actually going to impact good bacteria, so it's going to kill the good bacteria, so you want to avoid that. You want to make sure your hands are washed really well and give those good bacteria as good of a chance as they can to survive and flourish. So get rid of as many um, negative bacteria as possible. Uh, so the hands are clean, the knives are clean, and um, you're going to use either a glass bowl. Try not to use metal. So use either a glass or a melamine or um, maybe ceramic type of bowl. Okay, so um, I've already chopped this. You're going to take the core out as well. And again, you can depend, decide how big you like your cabbage, but I like it fairly thin. So I just take a knife and cut long strips. I've already taken the core out. You don't want to use the core because it's not going to ferment very well. I like mine kind of like long strips, so I'm just going to take the knife down after I've removed the core. And then I'll probably go back through it again. And you can see I'm getting nice long shreds of cabbage. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put sea salt this is a fine sea salt. You can use coarse sea salt. You need about five grams for a half of uh, cabbage. So if you're using coarse sea salt, maybe you're going to want to um, weigh it if you have a food scale at home, but it's not necessary to do that. So then what you do is you come in and it's probably going to take a few minutes to really nicely massage that sea salt in, and that salt is gonna help draw the water out of the cabbage. 
And that water is what we're going to use and what is going to be used to help ferment and create those good bacteria. So it's already getting nice and watery here. So I've really gotten in the habit of eating sauerkraut and I have to say, because it's so easy to do at home and so inexpensive, I mean a cabbage costs nothing, um, it's, a great, it's a great fermented food option. And I find it to be probably the most pleasant for the taste palette. Not everybody likes the taste of kimchi. I think it's more of an acquired, more of an acquired taste. So to me, or maybe it's my European background, I tend to like the sauerkraut. Okay, we're getting nice and juicy and watery here. And you can keep pushing out some of that water. If you're finding you don't have enough, I would just recommend adding another teaspoon of sea salt. Um, and then just check your fermentation because the more salt you add, the quicker it's gonna ferment. So maybe it'll take your process down from seven to five days or even four days. And you'll know when it's done. You'll be able to tell by the smell. And use your nose, use that um, sense of smell to be a real guide when you're fermenting food. If it smells off, chances are it is. It's supposed to smell sour and like fermented, but there's a significant difference in how that smells. Just like with yogurts or kefir, which I'm gonna talk about next. So use your nose. It's a great sense to have. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take it, and this has been sterilized, this jar. So remember, clean, Equipment is a good idea. I'm just gonna quickly wash my hands. And I'm gonna take this and we are going to pour the massage cabbage. And you can see there's a lot of liquid coming from that. Don't get rid of that. You are gonna use that because that liquid is what's going to start your fermentation process. Okay. Then you're gonna take either your hands and you're gonna to wanna to push down. So this is an actual tool that's meant for fermenting because we want to allow as much air as possible. Wow, this is fantastic. So we've got lots of water here, lots of juice flowing from the cabbage. See, when you grow your food yourself, <laughs> it works out even better. Okay, so we've got a really, really, really nice amount of water to start with. Now, one of the tricks is we want to keep this weighted down. So you can do a couple of different things. You can um, use different, you can use whatever you want really. This is actually a fermenting weight. So it's like a glass weight. And what I'm gonna do is because we wanna keep the cabbage submerged underneath the liquid. So I'm actually going to take this jar um, and I'm gonna put it on top and then I'm gonna stick the weight inside of it. And this keeps, helps to keep the cabbage completely submerged under the water. Then as you're checking it while it's fermenting over the next few days, you are gonna use the weight to press down and allow more of the juice to come back up, always fully keeping your cabbage submerged. Okay. All right, so you can actually use your hands and just press down on that. Now, there are two chains of thought. You can either fully close the lid which is often what I do because I'm here, I'm around to, and check it because that's one of the key things. So if you are gonna fully close your lid and seal it like so, meaning there's no air getting inside, you're gonna wanna do something called burping the jar. So each day, like every eight hours, once a day, you're gonna open it and allow some of the gas that's forming to escape or if you don't wanna do that and you literally wanna just leave it until five or six days from now, you can just take a cheesecloth or a clean cloth of any, of any kind. So this is cheesecloth, cheese which has lots of different uses. I use cheesecloth cheese for many different things. You can use it to strain um, nuts if you're making homemade nut milk. You can do all kinds of things. And I did have a rubber band here somewhere, but that's okay, it's not necessary. The point is you're gonna either take a string or a rubber band and you're gonna put it over top of it. So just as long as it's closed, we don't wanna leave it completely exposed to the air. And so we're gonna close that up and that is it. That is how you make sauerkraut. So simple, so easy. 
And this is gonna be a fantastic one because there's already lots of juice um, sitting and we are gonna let that ferment for five or six days and it's gonna end up looking like this. So you'll be able to tell when it's done. And uh, the longer you leave it outside, you're gonna put that in room temperature, preferably in the dark. Um, and that's where you're gonna allow it to ferment. So you're not gonna put it in the refrigerator until it's finished. Okay, so you, it stays out at room temperature. All right, super simple. Um, if we were doing vegetables, we would then be adding the brine, but the same process involved. So you're gonna pour the vegetables over, you're gonna weight it down, you're gonna cover it either partially or fully, and leave it in a cool, dark place and allow it to ferment for between five and seven days. And you can basically ferment any vegetable. So super simple. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to show, I'm just gonna push this out of the way. The next thing I want to talk about is kefir because kefir is also delicious, super simple to make, and tastes great. I absolutely love the smell, I love the tanginess. It's kind of like yogurt's drinkable cousin, I guess you will. Uh, one of the reasons I like making it myself is because you end up with a lot less sugar. So a lot of the commercial um, varieties of kefir have a lot of high sugar content. So when you make it yourself, anytime you can make something yourself, you can control what's going into it. So just like making um, sauerkraut and any fermented vegetables, it's not an exact science and there is a couple of different ways in which you can do it. The key thing is that if you're doing a dairy kefir, um, that you're using kefir grains that are meant for dairy. If you're using coconut milk as an example, you need to use a water-based kefir grain. So it just depends on what you're doing. Preferably whole milk, and in my opinion, organic, is the best starting material for it. Um, but goat milk will also work as well. You want the fat there from the whole milk and it will help to protect the bacteria and it'll help to protect it as it's going down your digestive tract when you're eating it. Um, so you can buy kefir grains in a couple different ways. These are freeze dried and they're super simple to use. So when you're just starting out and maybe you're making kefir for the first time, a freeze dried kefir might be a great option for you. Um, or you can buy the active kefir, kefir grains that are already active and you just literally pour them into milk and uh, let it sit for eight hours and then you're basically done. So a couple of different ways in which you can do that. So. When you're using a freeze-dried kefir grain like I have here, I have already heated the milk. I've brought it to a low boil, turned it off, and cooled it. And remember, whether you're using water, you've preheated water or milk, you want to make sure that it's cool because the warmth of it will actually start to break down the good bacteria. So we want to um, make sure that you've um, boiled the milk, let it cool, and it's completely at room temperature now. This is uh, about 500 mils of whole organic milk that I'm gonna just go ahead and pour into a clean jar. You can make more or less. I kind of always have kefir rolling. Um, so, and it's kind of neat when you get almost to the end, you can just take that and add it back into your new batch and uh, you end up with this beautiful delicious kefir and it smells so good and it's got this nice kind of tang and uh, really delicious scent. So this is the finished kefir. It took about 12 hours to um, start to ferment. This one requires for about 500 milliliters, we need about two and a half grams of these freeze dried kefir grains. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pour them into here, just like that. And I'm gonna grab a spoon and we're just gonna mix that up until there are no lumps. All right, so we're just stirring here and making sure that there are no lumps of kefir grains. And remember, it's going to be breaking down the lactose and using it as its food um, and eating it and creating these beautiful healthy bacteria. And so remember we talked about diversity, which is one of the best things that we can give to our gut. So if you're eating your fermented foods and you're eating your probiotic, prebiotic, and maybe having a spoonful of kefir every day, you're giving your gut such a tremendous uh, gift because you're allowing the beneficial bacteria to flourish and uh, have very diverse, very diverse bacteria, which is what we want. Okay. 
lumps are gone. That is simple. That is literally all you do. Then we're going to close it up, seal it, and put it in a coolish, uh, dark place and let it sit for about eight hours. You will know when it's ready because you will start to see the curds forming and you can open it up, smell it. If you want it thicker and more acidic, you really like that tang and you like that sour taste, just leave it out on the counter longer. And uh, when it's reached its desired doneness for what you like, then you're gonna put it in the fridge and enjoy each day. And as you get to the end, you can actually use your first uh, your first batch of kefir will be used to continue on. If you want to continue making more, you're just going to add more milk, go through the same process. Stir, let ferment, back into the fridge. And uh, there you've got a delicious and healthy way to make some fermented foods at home yourself. And again, remember food is health and health is a journey. And there's no better place to start than by feeding yourself well. So thanks for joining and I hope you learned all about fermenting today.